It turns out their leader was offended by the Seth Rogen movie. Oh my God. I thought it was fucking hilarious. We, sir, are live. Oh, well, I'll quit making Seth Rogen jokes then. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Honey, Honey you, you Should, should Read, read this. this. The next one, Blind Sight. It's honestly kind of a weird one. It's... So when I digest, when I read a story, I'm digesting it for character and right. plot and stories have to stick with me. And this story stuck with me, but it did so in a very different way. It just, there you go, look at that. It just really sort of sunk its claws into my brain because it really gives you a lot to think about from a societal point of view a science point of view. It is the only book, the only fiction book, with notes and references at the back that I read. And I read them vociferously. I was interested. I was curious. I was like, this was such a weird, fascinating read. I want to know more about the, about the philosophies presented, about the science presented. So one thing I honestly don't like about this book is the cover. It's a very accurate cover, but it's so plain and simple. It it, it feels a he little. He hates minimalism. I hate minimalism. Minimalism is for poor people. No, it's not. Minimalism. Or for rich people trying to pretend they're not rich. No. No. <laughs> minimalism is for those who know where the real value of life lies. Can Sex you... and hard drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. It, it just feels like it was whipped up in 20 minutes on Adobe Illustrator, which, oh. I mean, shit, that's how I do my covers. But I haven't gotten published by Tor, you know? I, would I don't love know, to. I kind of like it. I mean, it, it's great. It just, I don't know, it, 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 it doesn't. It, it's so simple, it doesn't capture just the menace and the dread that I feel reading parts of this novel. So you're saying it doesn't accurately represent the emotion of the book. Yeah, this is an existential kind of... philosophical crisis of oh. human evolution. Okay, well the cover sucks, so... <laughs> but you should read it! You should read it! And you should read it. Everybody should read it. Oh. Right. I wish more people would read this just so I could discuss it with them. It's like living through an event. Really? And then just discussing it with people afterwards, trying to wrap your mind around it. So it is fiction. But... Yeah, it's fiction. Okay. So it was published in 2006 by Peter Watts. Uh, I've tried a couple of other things by him. I have not enjoyed his earlier works, but I love this. And I love the sequel, which is one of those sequels where it takes place in the same universe, the same backstory has happened, but completely different characters, completely different situation. It's only, you know, related in the same way that... So it's not a sequel so much as a secondary book in the same timeline and universe. Yeah, but publishers still call them sequels. That doesn't make sense, because to me, a sequel means this came afterward. Whereas... Oh, is there... Yeah. Okay, well, I suppose we should just come up with a... Genre, a a, um, a new word. A new word. We need a new damn word. A, a word for when a book, when two books, have, are in the same universe, and they're in the same kind of timeline, but they're not with the same character. Universe in. sequel, unisequel. Except that kind of sounds like a unicorn on a unicycle. Unicycle. I don't know. <laughs> Someone should draw that. It sounds dope. Dope. <laughs> so anyway, the setting. Honestly, I just want to read the back cover real quick. Two months since the stars fell. Two months since 65,000 alien objects clinched around Earth like a luminous fist, screaming to the heavens as the atmosphere burned them to ash. Two months since that moment of brief, bright surveillance by agents unknown. Two months of silence while a world holds its breath. Now some half-derelict space probe hears a whisper from the edge of the solar system. And I'm going to try not to get into my uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson voice here. <laughs> I love you, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I so love you. 
a faint signal sweeping the co- I'm doing it. You can't do it. You can't. A you faint can't. signal sweeping the cosmos <laughs> like a lighthouse beam. Whatever's out there is talking, isn't talking to us. It's talking to some distant star, perhaps, or perhaps to something closer. So basically, to now not Neil deGrasse Tyson it, basically, there was like this entire network of lights entirely encapsulating the globe that just flared to life. Nobody knew they were there, but then, boom, Christmas lights. And then they burned up in the atmosphere. And it's undeniably alien. It's not some weird natural effect or event. Everyone knows something's out there. And it was watching us. They did this. They didn't hurt us. Hmm. But they're out there. And we better get our shit together and find out what's going on. So they send out some probes and nothing happens. And then they find this signal pointing to uh, out around the Kuiper Belt, which is out past Pluto. Neil Pluto deGrasse Tyson, doesn't exist anymore. It exists. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, I love you, man. <laughs> but come on, man. <laughs> what the fuck? When I was a kid, Pluto was a planet. Now it's a dwarf planet. Well, I thought it was characterized as a moon. No, no, no. It's the size of a moon. But it's it, it became... Oh, it dear. became its own classification of object. It is a Ooh. dwarf planet. It's well, not a planet. Well, good for Pluto, then. Yeah. And there are oh. actually other dwarf planets in our solar system with it. See, how come I've never heard that? I've only heard that, oh, well, Pluto's not a planet anymore. Well, because sorry. that's what makes headlines. It's Science true. Science doesn't make headlines. That's Emotions true. make headlines, and I still feel emotional <laughs> about Pluto. But no, no, it should be focused on Pluto is now part of a new group, a new c- category of planets. They're dwarf planets. Yeah. So anyway, so now that this has been discovered... Humanity's got to get its shit together, get out there, find out what's going on. Is this a threat? What is it? Where did it come from? What does it intend towards us? Mm-hmm. So it pulls. To, so they pull together a um, a really motley crew, which is kind of stereotypical. Yeah, it's always a motley, motley it, it crew. always is. It's the Suicide Squad of the far flung future. But what Peter Watts does with this cast is he's basically looking at societal trends and psychological conditions. Like here and now. Here and now. You said that this was 2006? Yeah. And Ooh. science and technology. And he's projecting, where could we go with these things? I see. What is the logical, societal, and human evolution? And that's really what all these characters are. They're no yeah. longer human, except for like one. They are post-human. The main character, Siri. He's Siri. Le- Siri, yes. <laughs> Alexa was not available for comment. <laughs> but Siri literally has half a brain. As a child, he had epilepsy or something like it oh, and wow. was racked with seizures. He was going to die. No. And the doctors did some hugely traumatic surgery and cut off half his brain. Isn't that and- a lobotomy? No, lobotomy is like where they go through the front and drill into it and dead in certain centers, which makes you a drilling moron. Which is horrible. Yes. But but no, he, he survives this. But it takes out all of his empathy. Oh, he no. is now a high-functioning sociopath. He's He can't understand emotion. He doesn't understand societal norms. Oh, no. Uh, the, what, how we first meet Siri is a flashback to when he was a kid after this had happened to him. And he's on a playground. And he's one of the losers. But his buddy or what used to be his friend, but he doesn't have friends anymore. Mm-hmm. He doesn't understand friendship. Right. Is being beaten up by some bullies. Siri goes to his friend's aid and actually kills one of the kids. And, like, takes out another couple of them. They're, the kids are, you know, a little graphic, but they're crawling broken and bloody across yeah. the playground. And Siri's just like, what's wrong with everyone? I, I protected my friend. They were picking on oh, him, I you know? See. Oh, one's dead. I suppose I should feel bad about that. That is a problem. It is. So that's Siri. Susan. Susan is really weird. She has multiple personality disorder. Oh, okay. Or she would have if she were born in this time and place. Like a computer, her brain has been purposefully partitioned into separate personalities. 
Oh, fascinating. And she can switch between them almost at her will. Okay. So the way that you can partition a computer to have multiple hard drives, multiple yeah. operating systems anyway, that's Susan's brain. She's the gang of four. It's Susan, it's James, and then a couple of other personalities whose names I don't remember. Oh, all within Susan. All within Susan. Fascinating. Yeah. And it's can really Can I talk to James, please? I mean, that does kind of happen. And they all have distinct <laughs> personalities and different roles. And that's why she's special and part of this group. Because she's able to process things in such an alien way. That's interesting. Yeah. I feel like that sometimes. And then there's the Marine, Amanda, who's basically just there to kick ass and take names. Um, there's a couple Always of other characters. Always have to have And then... You'll laugh at this, because I laughed at this, but there's a vampire. <laughs> See, I told you. I told you you'd fucking laugh. <laughs> but it's actually really interesting what they do with the vampires in this book. Vampire was an extinct apex predator. Okay. And humanity thought, you know what? We have the technology now. Let's resurrect them. Let's bring them back to the modern age. Oh my age. goodness. It's Jurassic World all over It's again. kind of Jurassic Park. Yeah. Jurassic Park. And there are Humanity some, is a moronic society. There's this really good example. Um, I, want, I want you to picture that three-dimensional wireframe cube in your mind. What? A cube yes. wireframe where you can see all the oh, yeah, yeah, edges. Yeah, yeah. And you know how if you look at it, it looks like you're looking down on the box, but if yeah. you sort of flip your brain, mm -hmm. you're looking at it from the front? Yeah, I like this. Or it's like the picture of, is it two faces kissing? <laughs> or is it a vase? Vampires see both at the same time. Oh! They don't switch their brain back and forth. They don't switch their sight. Right. They're just so alien. They're able to just. It's specifically process mentioned both as an example. Once. They can process both at once. They wow. have this higher functioning brain power, and they did prey on humans. They are the superior being, but they have a glitch: the crucifix glitch. If they see actual intersecting right angles. It burns their brain out. But wait a minute. There are a lot of intersecting right angles. So they wear the these special goggles oh. that, like, I don't know, I guess... Curve them? Bleh. <laughs> bleh the angles. Weird. Yeah, it's weird. And so they've got all these weird people on this ship going out there. Okay, yeah, back to the, back to the book. I'm... Yeah. Right. So that's pretty much all of the characters. And the ship itself is a character, the Theseus. No way! Is it sentient? Yes, but... And the ship is what's in charge. The ship is in command. The vampire's the second in command, and he relays all the orders to the, okay. uh, to the crew. I don't know if I want to be part of that crew. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. The ship is the captain, and its second in command is a vampire. Who oh, that's might... not even where the bad shit comes from. At least <laughs> not until... Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. The things that really stuck with me are things that kind of have to be read to be experienced. I'm not going to do justice to them. Okay, well, here, here we go. I'm really interested in this one. I will read it to the best of my ability. It's and a hard read. We can though. talk about it again with spoilers this time. It is one of the weirdest written books I've ever read. How I don't, so? I don't know really how to explain what sense it is. It's not. It's kind of first person, but let me just... No, nope, not that page. Not the prologue. Hmm. <laughs> Imagine you are Siri Keaton. Oh, so you're like putting yourself in the characters. Yeah. You oh. wake in an agony of resurrection, gasping after a recording, sh record-shattering bout of sleep apnea, blah, blah, blah. And then later it shifts to, imagine you are Susan James. Oh, okay. And I like that, though. I could do that. It is, but there's so few books that aren't written in either third person or first person. It's really hard to follow. And this guy does not hold your hand at all. The first time I read it, I got halfway through the book, and then something struck me. I was like, where the fuck did this other character come from? <laughs> this character, Cunningham, was not in the book before. I could swear, did I miss it? You know what I mean? Right, I, right. And I couldn't figure it out, and finally I just threw my hands up in the air, and I went, fine, fine. There's another character. I don't know what happened, but there's another character. I mean, it's on a ship in space out past Jupiter. You don't have another character just pop up. Right. Well, it turns out they pull him out of cryo because they need him. But I'd missed that, and I don't usually miss a lot when right. I'm reading. 
And the book does not hold your hand at all to help you transition from scenes or even from characters because it doesn't use the names of characters very often. And so you just shift oh. from one character to the next. And if you miss the context, it's really hard to tell who's Yeah, who. that will take me a while. It, it, it was a difficult book to read. I'll try it, though. You know, it's not like Game of Thrones where, oh, well, it's obviously uh, mm. Peter Dinklage now. Sorry, right. I'm blanking. Tyrion. It's or not is, Tyrion or Daenerys or like Or like Crows where the chapter starts yeah. with the character's name. Yeah. So you know always who you're, yeah. who you're reading from. Okay, well, cool. There are just a couple of things in here that really stuck with me. It, it, really, it really digs into psychological issues and things. Not like brain not like diseases but like weird tricks of the mind like when you think you see something out of the corner of your eye but there's nothing there oh creepy yeah that happens in the book that's a major plot point what is this what's actually happening in your brain electrically and chemically that causes that and what happens if we tweak that Ooh. like there are really weird scientific studies and tests that have been done where humans respond in just really freaky ways to changing brain patterns and electricity things and chemistry well, things. Yeah. Like insisting that, no, I'm dead. Well, how can you be talking to me if you're dead? I'm dead. I'm not alive anymore. I'm dead. Or this is not my arm. What is weird. this doing attached to me? This is not my arm. All these sorts of weird... <laughs> it, it's, a, it's creepy in places. Because as they encounter things, the electrical, magnetic fields... It, so it's not... It doesn't attribute this to like magic or anything. No, there's no magic. There are vampires. Yeah. But there's no magic. Yeah, it's all science. But vampires are not science. It, it sort of explores the science of what if vampires were there. And honestly, it's really weird that he included a vampire. <laughs> because it really does feel tonally out of place right. with everything else that is going on. But right. you just kind of shrug and accept it. Okay. No, Sarasti, he's a vampire. Everyone's terrified of him. Don't mess with him. But no magic. Yeah, okay. no magic. So the main takeaway I got from this. Sentience consciousness mm -hmm. I think therefore I am a lot of science fiction that I deeply love like Star Trek all of the aliens are humanoid you just yeah. get some prosthetics and you put it on the ears yeah. or the foreheads or the teeth or you change a color you know put some body paint on it's rare that I have found stories that are both good and really do things interesting with aliens where it's not just humanoid this book goes so far as to examine aliens if aliens had no consciousness of self and that's kind of a spoiler but it's critically important to this book and by the time you get to the end of the book I was honestly just a little shaken like wow obviously this isn't real right but wow, that really calls into question the entire the entirety of existence of what it. I'm, I'm slipping back into my Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> what it means to be human is <laughs> is self consciousness, self awareness. Is it important? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Does it make us part of the greater universe or does it make us an anomaly to be destroyed? That's blindsight. It fucking stays with me. And it's an event. Will I read it? You should. I will try. It's weird. How many times have you read it? Uh, two or three times. Okay. And as I'm going to be saying probably every time, I really want to read it again now. This is just going to make your read reading list just stack up and try yeah. to make jam. <laughs> yeah, it is. This is a trippy, trippy, weird little bastard of a book, <laughs> and I love it. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you. Until next time, bye. Bye. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so... You can't keep your hands to yourself, can you? Irresistible. 
I'm concerned that your beard is going to be scratching upon the microphone and it's going to make little, you know. <laughs> I felt kind of good again. Ow. <laughs>